that said, we're going to be looking today at verses 9 through 11 as we continue through our series here in the uh, Gospel of Mark. And so I'll read verses 9 to verse 11, and I'm going to give to you uh, introductory comments, and then we'll move into our study. So beginning at verse 9 in Mark 16, and reading to verse 11. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Madeline, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. So as is my natural way of teaching, at least recently, I'll give you a bit of a, of a background so we can lead to these verses and, and gain a better understanding. Uh, Mark at this point is beginning to speak of the appearances of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Now many people think that when Jesus was resurrected, he immediately went to heaven, but the Bible doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that in fact, he remained on, on planet Earth for over a month, and he appeared before various witnesses. You see, his teaching ministry didn't cease when he died and was resurrected. As a matter of fact, he, he, he continued to teach for several days before he ascended. Acts chapter 1, verse 3 says that he, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so Jesus was still on planet Earth for 40 days prior to his ascension, and while he was here, there were many infallible things that he was doing, and he was teaching them concerning the work of God and how he rules in people's lives. Now, after 40 days, Jesus ascended, according to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It says, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So Mark Mark doesn't include all of his appearances, but he does include a select few. He speaks, and we'll be looking at this, of his appearing to Mary. He speaks of his appearing to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he speaks of his appearing to ten apostles. He points those things out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to these appearances as we come to a close. We're not closing today, but as we are coming to a close of our study of the Gospel of Mark. And so we'll begin here in verse 9 in Mark 16, and again I'll read it to you. It says, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, or Madeline, out of whom he had cast seven demons. So he notes Jesus' appearance to Mary. Now how beautiful it is to realize that Mary would be mentioned in this way. Mark makes it very clear that she was deliver, delivered from seven demons. So what a picture of God's grace that she was the first to see an empty tomb. We have Mary Magdalene, we have Mary the mother of James, we have Joanna and Salome, Salome and they have come early. They've come to complete the burial of Christ, but he's not there. Luke tells us in chapter 24, verses 2 and 3, that they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So that caused them confusion. They're at a loss. What's happened? So at that time, two angels spoke to them, asking, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. You have come, he's saying, to anoint a dead body. But he's not dead. He's alive. And he goes on, don't you remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? In Luke 24, 7, it says that he said, Jesus said this, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. So don't you remember that? Well, Mark 16, 8 says that they had gone out quickly, they fled the tomb, because they were trembling. So Mary and the others had left the tomb amazed and quiet, and at first they said nothing because they were terrified. 
But later, Mary went to the apostles. It says in verse 10 that she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And so, at first, they don't understand what is taking place, but their eyes are about to be opened. And in order to develop this a bit further with you, I'd like you to do something. Would you please, if you will, turn to John chapter 20, because I want to supplement this account with another gospel, and I'm going to do so by turning you to John 20, if you'd like. And those who don't want to, that's okay, too. Just leave. <laughs> Somebody says, you know, I'm new at this thing, looking to the Bible and all. Where is John 20? Okay, John 20 is after John 19 and just before John 21. That should help you a lot. John 20. Again, this was something, this resurrection and all that's going on is something they had yet to understand. They're confused, understandably. John 20, verses 9 and 10 says, they, they did not, uh, yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. They didn't know by experience. They were aware of scriptures that spoke of that. They even were aware of Jesus as saying that, but they didn't know it by experience. They didn't know that yet. They didn't know the scripture yet. So when Mary had first told the apostles, two of them had responded quickly. Look at John 20, verses 2 and 3. In John 20, verses 2 and 3, it says, She, uh, she ran and came to Simon Peter, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved said to them, they, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. And so this is what's taking place. They're, they're going to the tomb. But John outran Peter, and he being younger and all, he, he arrived at the empty tomb first. And, and the Scripture tells us that he stooped, stooped down, he looked in, and he saw the linen cloths that were lying there. Just seeing that was enough for him. He didn't go into the tomb. But here comes the apostle Peter, and, and he, he came and he saw the tomb, and as is true of his nature, he went in. He saw the linen cloth lying there, the handkerchief that was wrapped around his head. Well, it says that after Peter went in, John went in also. But it seems that they had different reactions because Luke tells us, in chapter 24, verse 12, that Peter departed marveling to himself at what had happened. What he had done is he had seen an empty tomb. But John had understood why it's empty. Because in verse 8 of John 20, it tells us that John saw and believed. And so again in John 20, verse 10, the disciples went away again to their own homes. They didn't understand what happened. And and they left. They went to their own homes. Perhaps they had homes in Jerusalem, or perhaps they went to a friend's house or a rented place that they were using. So this is all taking place. And Mary's there. Mary's unwilling to leave. Mary has remained behind. Mary is determined to find out what happened, and she's not about to leave. It may be that she was hoping to find someone who could give her information to help her in order that she might understand what's taking place. In verse 11 of chapter 20, it says, Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She stood outside by the tomb. Now, the picture that you saw today, the picture of that that garden tomb that we visit when we're in Israel, if you, if you noted that picture... Um, you can see that the entrance to that is large. That's only because it's been opened up so, so people like us, they call us pilgrims, can go in. Ordinarily, the tomb's opening was not that wide. That one has been enlarged. That's why it says that Mary stooped down to look in because the tomb was not uh, normally having it, a large opening but something that was generally a lot smaller. As a matter of fact, a common tomb, and you see common tombs in Israel. When you're there, we'll stop in a particular place there, uh, and you'll see that carved out of rock very often, they would uh, open it up, make an opening, and actually carve out. And then what would happen is they would take the body of the deceased, and they would slide the body in. So it's really small. And then they would seal it. 
and they had uh, an opening at the top so that, as, as John mentioned earlier, so that the stench of decay would have a place to escape. It wasn't large enough for animals to get in necessarily, but it would release the, the smell of, of decay. And they would leave the body there for approximately a year, and then at the end of the year, when uh, the body had decomposed, then they would come and unseal the tomb and remove the bones, and they would put them in what is called a sarcophagus. And so the, the bones themselves would be placed in a box, and that tomb would be reused later on by some other family member. That's what they would do. So in the case of Jesus, he was in a borrowed tomb of a rich man. It would have been more ostentatious, a lot larger, and that's the tomb that you see when you're in, in Israel. That's the one that we visit so Mary is there, she's outside the tomb, she's weeping, she stoops down, and she takes a look. And the Bible tells us that she is, she is crying strong tears. The word weeping means that she's mourning with great pain and terrible grief. She loved G Jesus Christ, and, and, and she's crying as if her heart will break. Some of us understand that. Some of us understand that. Not everybody not everybody does. Some people think when you cry like that, you're weak. Some people think that if you have tears like that, you have no faith. The deeper you love, the deeper you grieve. And it isn't wrong for you to grieve with mighty strong tears because that reveals so much of how much love you have. So I don't, I don't look at her as being faithless, though she is, and I'll show you something. She is acting in unbelief. But she's just standing there just... I don't know what's going on. And she's sobbing, crying. She loved Jesus, and she's unwilling to leave the place where he'd been buried. Mary fears that the body has been stolen and that it'll be abused by evil people. Now, we as 21st century Americans, we say to ourselves, that's kind of an odd concept, but when you think about it for just a moment, you have to realize that that still happens to this day. When Americans have been fighting overseas and they have had their lives taken. There are too many accounts of enemy soldiers taking the Americans' bodies and dragging them through the streets and desecrating them. That isn't a new thing. That is something that happened and has happened over the centuries. And so she's concerned that somebody will take and has taken the body of Christ and, and is abusing that body, not respecting, not showing reverence for who he is. And her, her mind is filled with all the evil that could be happening. Again, Mary loved, she loved him deeply. Why? Well, because he had forgiven her and restored her. Again, Mark, as well as Luke, Luke in chapter 8, verse 2, and Mark also uh, speaks of the fact that she was possessed, demonized by seven demons. When you see the number seven there, very often it's to illustrate something. Seven is the number of completeness in Scripture. It's used often, seven days of creation, various other places, as, as completion. And so seven has a uh, uh, scriptural meaning very often of complete or perfect. And so when it speaks of her being possessed by seven demons, it's saying that she was completely demonized, totally possessed. It was a complete possession. This is a woman who had been severely possessed in a life that who knows where it had led her. But undoubtedly, it was one filled with pain and shame and embarrassment. I mean, who wants to take a demon-possessed kid to the family functions and say, oh, by the way, this is Mary. She's kind of messed up right now. <laughs> it's bad enough when your weird Uncle Bob shows up, but how about Mary? <laughs> Demonized, man, seven demons. So there's a shame and embarrassment that she has in her life. And her family and everybody who knew her. We don't know what she did. We don't know what kinds of things she could have done. What, what would she do under the influence of a demon? 
there are demons that are referred to as unclean spirits. And, and the reason they're referred to as unclean spirits isn't simply because they're unclean spiritually. It's because they, they, they provoke the individuals who are possessed by them into doing unclean things, whether it's living in a tomb or whether it's being sexually active in uh, improper ways. It, it's uncleanness, and that's what it is. And she had seven demons, and, and she lived a life of, of misery. Uh, when someone's demonized, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're always under the influence of the demon because there's plenty of evidence in, in Scripture, as well as just people who have encountered demonized people, that there sometimes will be a time when their mind is, seems to be in the right place, and other times when it's totally not. And so this is a woman, undoubtedly, who had experience with clarity for a while, and then other times when she didn't have it. And, and here came Jesus, and when he saw her, he delivered her. And when he delivered her, her life was entirely different. It would have been very similar to, to when Jesus cleansed that man who was possessed by legion. And, 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 and at one point, he was cutting himself with stones and moaning and, and groaning and scaring people. And they would put chains on him, and, and he would scare everybody who was coming by and all. And then there he is after he's been, he's been released from the, the grip of these demons. And you see him at, at the feet of Christ, receiving from him and desiring to follow him. Well, Mary, not to say that she was like that, but Mary had a similar experience where she had seven demons, and she's been set free. And now she just loves this one who set her free. And he's dead. At least in her mind he is. Jesus had healed her broken, sin-filled heart. And he won her love. She was a sinful woman who was saved by a loving Savior. She reminds me, though she's not the same woman, but she reminds me of the woman you find in the Gospel of Luke. That woman who came in where Jesus was at Simon the Pharisee's house and was weeping and ended up anointing his feet, kissing his feet. And when Simon the Pharisee, who invited Christ to the, to the supper, saw that Jesus was allowing such a thing to happen, began to wonder within himself. He even said in, in, in himself, if this man truly were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman it is who's touching him. She's a sinner. And that's when Jesus gave that very famous story to him, the question, someone owes a lot, somebody owes little. The person who has the amount owed to them has forgiven them completely. Who's going to love them most? Well, I suppose the one who's been forgiven most. And that's when Jesus pointed out this woman and spoke concerning the fact that she had shown him adoration and love and all of that. And then he said, he said to, uh, to him, I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but went on to say, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. If there's anything that I think the church needs to wake up to today, and I don't speak as a prophet, neither the son of a prophet, I simply speak as a person who's been walking with the Lord for a while and has a burden for the church. If there's anything the church needs to, we as believers, whether it's Calvary Chapel, a Presbyterian, a Baptist, a Foursquare, it doesn't matter what we need to return to is a, a humble love for what Christ has done for us. And we need to remember what he's done for us. What were you like before you were saved? What is your real testimony? Everybody's got one. Everybody's got a real testimony. And we've got the ones that we talk about in public. The things we talk about in public are the things that really aren't that embarrassing. As a matter of fact, sometimes we even glory in the things that we talk about being set from, free from. Oh, I used to drink. I used to smoke. I used to this. I used to that. It's almost like we're glorying and people saying, wow, wow, what a wild life you lived. And then you get somebody to come up after you've given your testimony and they want to top yours. This guy used to drink a case of beer, I drank two. You know. And before you know it, you have testimony, you know, playoffs. Who's gonna be the champion, right? <laughs> Who is the worst sinner? You killed one, I killed six. <laughs> but we, we, we end up glorying in the sin and not in the Savior. I think testimonies are important. Thank God we have them. But you have the one you tell and you have the one you keep. Which one are you most grateful for? The one you keep to yourself. Why? Because you and I, and I'm not condemning you, I'm pointing my, you know, my mommy used to say, you point a finger at me, you got three pointing at yourself, son. 
So I do it like this. No, I. <laughs> no, I'm not condemning anyone. I'm remembering my own. I think that's important. I think it's important that you remember where you came from. She did. This was a man who won her heart because he healed it. It had been broken by the world. And the healer, the one who came, Luke 4, tells us to heal the brokenhearted, had healed her broken heart. This was a woman who had the kind of love that a Christian ought to have for Jesus Christ. It was a totally spiritual adoration of the one who loved her and changed her life. She loved, and he's dead. And he's dead. One of the things that we need to remember, I believe, is, as Christians, is that God forgave us completely of all of our sins, not just some, but all. All, And when we understand that, when we comprehend that, and we apprehend the grace that has been given to us, our lives change, and, and those refusing God's offer of forgiveness will remain in bondage to sin and sorrow. That, that's why we repent. Proverbs 28, 13 says it like this. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So we confess, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, it says in verse 12 and 13, she looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. Notice that seeing two angels doesn't disturb her. They appear to be human beings. She's upset over a missing body. But look at their question. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping is intended to reveal the state of her heart. You see, her, her love for Christ is intense and pure and total devotion for him. But her concern is revealing the root of her sorrow, which is unbelief. So they're saying, in essence, your tears are unnecessary. Why are you crying? You should be rejoicing. But here you are, crying your heart out. Why are you crying? Well, she says, verse 13, she tells them, because they've taken away my Lord, I don't know where they've laid him. Somebody removed his body. I don't know where they took it. That reveals her plan for a proper burial. She's very much like many today, though. Jesus is alive, but many live like he's dead. One commentator said this could also be said of many pulpits today. To please man, Jesus has been taken from those who seek him. We can live like Jesus didn't rise and fail to exercise what we have in him. See, we've been blessed abundantly in Christ because he rose, because he conquered death. Mary is not apprehending or comprehending that at the moment, but those of us who have heard the resurrection story can still act as if he didn't raise from the dead. Paul tells us that in Christ we're blessed. Ephesians 1 verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. When he spoke to the Corinthians, he said, you fall behind in no spiritual gift. God has given to you so many blessings. In Jesus, we are redeemed. In Jesus, we have eternal life, forgiveness of sins. In Jesus, we're reconciled to God. We're justified. We've been adopted. We're delivered from darkness. In Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. We have fellowship with God. We're new creations, rescued from wrath. We have peace. We have joy. We have hope. We're protected from Satan. We have purpose and a heavenly home. These are all things from Jesus that we have. These are things that matter in life. Amen. And Mary needs to learn something that every believer should know. 
Jesus is alive. Now in verse 14, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. I will take him away. Notice how Christ asked the same basic question. Woman, why are you weeping? He went on to say, Whom are you seeking? Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? You see, she says, tell me where you laid him, I'll take him away. That's a picture, I think, of a burden that many will have and have experienced through a false religion, through a false religion. A small woman carrying a dead body, a small woman carrying an impossible burden something she couldn't carry. False religions are populated by disciples who carry around in their hearts a dead teacher, one who can't help, one who can't speak as we have through the word of God, one who can't bring comfort or communicate, a, 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 a dead teacher who can't do anything but burden a follower. In Luke 24, 5, it, it, it reads, why do you seek the living among the dead? You see, Christians don't carry around the body of a dead master. We have a living Lord, and he carries us. In Isaiah 40, verse 11, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. He carries us. Well, in verse 15, she's supposing him to be the gardener. She speaks to him at first, notice supposing, at first she doesn't recognize him. She mistakenly supposes him to be the caretaker of an enormous garden. The garden that Jesus is buried in is not some small plot. It's a good size. And so he, Joseph of Arimathea would have had a gardener to take care, probably a crew, to take care of all of the things that he had growing in that particular orchard there and at first, she doesn't recognize Christ. She supposes him to be the caretaker. It's early. She's distressed. She's blinded by her tears, and she's confused because of these things. But there's a greater reason that, that she didn't recognize him. She was in a state of unbelief. She didn't expect to see him alive. And so the question again is asked, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She had forgotten that Jesus said he would rise from the dead. She's aware of the teaching. But it wasn't something she could grasp. So it says in verse 15, supposing him to be the gardener. Her distress and fear was that he had been taken and his body dishonored and that's upsetting her. So thinking that Jesus is Joseph's gardener, she begs for the body. She's so emotionally distressed, she can't recognize his voice. Her determination is so strong that she doesn't see the impossibility of the task. There's no way she alone could carry his dead body, but she says, I will take him away. And then, verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him, Rabboni. It's a voice of the shepherd, and this little sheep recognized it finally because he called her by name. She called her by name. Instead of woman, which is a respectful term, by the way, instead of saying woman, he said to her, Mary. You can almost hear the tenderness in his voice. Mary. She hears his voice, and it brings comfort. On an earlier occasion, Jesus had sent his men into a storm. We saw that when we looked at chapter 8. Of Mark he had sent them across the lake and he had spent time alone in prayer and later in the evening 
He saw them as they were struggling and rowing, and he walked on water toward them, the Bible tells us, and as he came near to them, they saw him, but they thought he was a ghost. They didn't recognize him. And they were struggling, and now there's fear added to the struggle. According to Mark 8, verse 50, it says, Immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. There's something about the comfort of the voice of our master that can bring peace in an unsettled situation. For these men to hear his voice when he says to them in the way he did, It's me. Cheer up, have courage, don't be afraid. They heard that, well, in this particular case, there's Mary, she's emotionally, put yourself in a place, she's emotionally distressed, she's hurting so badly. She's confused. And she sees somebody there in the gloomy darkness, her eyes are blinded by her tears, and she sees him, she thinks he's the gardener. Where, where have they taken him? And then he says her name. And as he speaks to her and she recognizes his voice, her fear and her pain are released. She hears the voice of a shepherd. And as she says, Ravoni, my dear master, she falls at his feet. She embraces his feet. She clings to him. And then notice verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, say to them, I'm, as, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. She's clutching him. She's afraid, appears, uh, she's afraid of losing him again. So he says, don't cling to me, as if our old relationship, the one that we had prior to my death, burial, now my resurrection, is going to continue to exist in that way. It's not. Our, our old relationship is, be, is not being resumed a new work is occurring. I'm no longer to be physically present with you. Now, remember earlier, he had told his disciples it was necessary for him to leave. He had said in, in John 16, verse 7, he said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. It's necessary that I leave because the Spirit has to come. He had prepared his men in John 14, 16 through 18. He had said to them, I'll pray the Father. He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I'm not going to stay. I'm not going to continue here. I have work to do. I'm ascending to my Father. I will send the Holy Spirit. I will not leave you orphans. You need to understand that. And then he goes into verse 17, and he says, and continues, go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father, to your Father, my God, your God. Tell them what you have seen. Psalm 22, verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. Tell them what you've seen. I think one of, the, one of the strategies of Satan that has really had an impact is by impressing people to value the attention and respect of the world. So, if someone says something that they don't like, they believe for some reason, this person whose feelings are hurt because of what has been said, they believe for some reason that they have the right, the entitlement to live in a world where they never get hurt feelings. People from my generation, I know it's ancient, people from my generation knew that was just part of being alive. That's just a fact. There's always going to be some meathead who hurts your feelings. It's always going to be somebody who's, who's going to see something about you and point it out to somebody else. I remember one time when I was 12 years old, I was in seventh grade, and my mom used to buy me clothes that I'm going to grow into. <laughs> glasses that made me look like Superfly. Some of you might remember that one. <laughs> Big old glasses. And... and pants with the waist that was two inches bigger than my actual waist. So you had to kind of cinch up the belt and it's kind of bulging there and you look like a dork. 
That's a word we used to use. And I would put paper in my back pockets because of, they were so baggy. I was, oh, so embarrassed. Like, you know, but you, you wear what you got to wear, right? And I went to school. I still remember, and I was there, and the teacher asked me to come up when I'm wearing these baggy pants, and it wasn't cool to have baggy pants then. And I go walking up. She says, can you write on the board, David? And I start to write, and one of my ex-friends, Mike, Mike O'Haran, I still remember. Mike, if you're hearing me, I still hate you. <laughs> he goes, look at them pants. You know, and even as a kid, you, you want to be liked and respected. But that was life, man. People would humiliate you. And you know what you did? You learned to live with it. It actually toughened you up. And it made you strong. It got to the point where you realize that you got to be true to yourself. And as a Christian, true to your God and true to others. And if people don't like you, that's just too bad. But guess what? Today, there's, eh, we, I'm just talking to, I'm preaching to the choir, you know this. But some of us are still afraid to be rejected by the world. Guess what? There's one who will reject us that I should fear, and that's my God. Because Jesus said to us, he said, don't fear the one who can kill you and has nothing else he can do. Uh, if you want to fear someone, fear the one who can kill you and cast you into hell. That's the one you should fear. And that's true. So if people don't like you, don't come home and cry about it. Because guess what? It doesn't at the end matter. Now, if you're a jerk, well, maybe you ought to change. Sometimes, we, sometimes we, we deal with what we are. We have to learn. That's part of the process. But if they are doing things and saying things that hurt your feelings to the point where you're just going to be quiet, I'll show you, go to hell. That's not a right thing to do. That's why I think that if there's ever going to be a true revival, it's going to be when Christians from young and old Stop silencing ourselves and begin to speak openly because that's what revival is. It's when we speak of who Jesus Christ is, you see? And the world right now is, has clamped on you. They're, 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 they're saying you're a bigot because you don't think that a man dressed like a woman should be teaching our children in, in a, a story hour. And, oh, I don't want to say something because, no, you should. No, I'm not saying be cruel. Don't, I'm not saying be mean. But we should say, now, wait a minute. The school board, you don't have the right to tell me how to raise my kid. You, you don't have that right. And so I'm going to raise my kid the way I should. And, and a lot of parents, a lot of parents are afraid. Don't be. Just be respectful. Be res there was, they used to call it the silent majority. Sometimes it only takes one voice to activate the rest. It says, you know, you're right about that, see? So we need to be open. So don't be afraid of that. You see, because what happens here is she goes and she speaks. I got saved. I told my friends. I told my family. I told everybody I've been doing it now for 52 years. I told people about Jesus Christ. That's what you do. Why? Because he's the only Savior in the world. He's the only one who died on a cross for me. He's the only one who gave me life. That's why it just makes sense to me. So speak. Well, she went, verse 18, and we'll close, and came to the disciples. She'd seen the Lord. And then he had spoken these things to her. She testified of what Jesus had told her. She's the first one to see the risen Lord and to, to testify of his resurrection. The one who is delivered of devils is the first to declare his victory. And so closing, and I'll just read Mark 16, 10, and 11 in close. She went, told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. When they heard that he was alive, had been seen by her, they did not believe. This is just too good to be true. They refused to listen to what she had to say at first. Luke 24, 11 says they didn't believe the women because their words seemed to be like nonsense. Well, it seemed like nonsense then to those who had been prepared for this, and it seems like nonsense to people today. The words that Jesus Christ is alive for people today, it still seems like nonsense. But in 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul said it well. He said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What has changed your life? It's the power of God. The Holy Spirit dwelling within us, activating us, gifting us, 
working within, directing our footsteps as we read the scriptures, who has given us hope, has given us faith, has given us life, has given us joy, has given us peace, this Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, the love and, and, and all the rest that, that we have in him. That comes because Jesus Christ is alive. It didn't come because we just want to feel good about these things. It comes because we've been energized by the power of the Spirit to live for God by his Holy Spirit because we trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way it works. And that's what we should be doing today. I believe that the church needs to wake up in these last days let our light so shine that, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Our Father, we bless.